everyone. You remember what today's chapter is going to be about? Brought a fork. I'm ready. From Hand to Mouth by James Cross Giblin. I should know by now. Let's find it. Hope you've been having a good day today. We read all about chopsticks yesterday. If you missed it, go back and learn about chopsticks. Today, the fork comes to the table. Chapter 5. About the year 1000, according to an Italian story, a wealthy nobleman from Venice, the great trading city, met a beautiful Turkish princess while he was traveling in the Middle East. After a brief courtship, the nobleman married the princess and returned with her to Venice. Along with her jewels, the princess's luggage contained a case of table forks. Forks had been in common use in the royal courts of the Middle East since at least the seventh century, and the princess had eaten with them all of her life. The first fork was probably a crotched stick with the two prongs sharpened at the end. Early people must have discovered that natural forks like this came in handy when they were roasting meat over a fire. The first metal forks were massive ones made of bronze that the ancient Egyptians used to lift sacrificial offerings of food in religious ceremonies. The Greeks and Romans also had ceremonial forks and large two-pronged kitchen forks. Some small silver forks have even been found in the ruins of Pompeii and Her Hercule Herculaneum, Herculaneum, two Roman cities that were buried by the volcanic eruption of Mount Vesuvius in AD 79. But there's no record of people eating with forks until they began to appear on wealthy tables in the Middle East in the 600s. There's a picture here of a two-pronged Roman fork made of bronze courtesy of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The princess's forks created a sensation when she set them out in the dining room of her new home in Venice. One observer commented, instead of eating with her fingers like other people, the princess cuts up her food into small pieces and eats them by means of little golden forks with two prongs. Another called her behavior luxurious beyond belief. The church leaders of Venice were even more shocked. God in his wisdom has provided man with natural forks, his fingers, said one. Therefore, it is an insult to him to substitute artificial metallic forks for them when eating. Shortly afterward, according to the story, the princess was afflicted with a terrible illness and died. Some declared solemnly, solemnly that it was God's will. Others said it was because she insisted on eating with a fork. Whatever the explanation, it would be another 300 years before the use of the fork at a table became common in Italy. Meanwhile, European cooks continued to carve and serve meat with the help of large two-pronged forks, as they had since the days of the Roman Empire. In 1361, table forks were listed for the first time in an inventory of silverware owned by the Council of the Italian City of Florence. Italian cookbooks began to mention table forks in the late 1400s. And in 1533, Catherine de' Medici, daughter of the ruler of Florence, introduced the fork to France. The 14-year-old Catherine brought several dozen with her to Paris when she married the future French king, Henry II. Many Frenchmen thought it was affected to eat with a fork. They laughed when they heard that some diners at Henry II's court, who were unfamiliar with the utensil, allowed half the food to fall off their, hork uh, fall off their fork between plate and mouth. But gradually, the use of table forks spread out from the king's palace to wealthy homes throughout France. It took longer for the fork to reach England, perhaps because the island British were traditionally suspicious, suspicious of things that came from abroad. Sorry, the island British. That was confusing to me. The island British were traditionally suspicious of things that came from abroad. I think what they mean by the island British is that they lived sort of exclusively in a place where they didn't, didn't interact as much as if they were to have a land barrier between, or a land border between two different places. They had the water, so they didn't have as much kind of traffic back and forth. That's my guess. Thomas Coryat, Coryat? C-O-R-Y-A-T-E, Coryat, who traveled widely in Italy and France, claimed in a book published in 1611 that he was the first man in London to eat with a fork. His friends made fun of him, Coriate wrote, and called him vociferous. This is a hard one this, this time. This chapter is tough. Vociferous, which meant pitchfork handler. Pitchfork handler. 
To which Corrier replied, wait and see, one day you each will have a fork, mark my words. And he was right. Within a few years, every member of the British royal family and the court possessed a fork. By the mid 1600s, eating with a fork had become the fashion among British tastemakers and the nobility. From, the practice, from them, the practice trickled down to the merchants and craftsmen and eventually to the poor, as styles and customs usually did. Cutlery censors such as Shutfield, England, now produce large numbers of forks along with knives and spoons. Like spoons, forks could either be cast in molds or stamped from bars of metal. Their prongs, called tines, were usually made of steel or silver, while the handles might be carved from precious or semi-precious materials like rock crystal and ivory. Among the rich, the beauty and rarity of one's personal eating utensils had long been a mark of social status. When European nobles were wealthy and wealthier commoners went on trips, they often carried their cutlery with them, just as we carry our truth toothbrushes. This was not due to fastidiousness, but simply because many inns of the time still did not provide guests with utensils. Travelers wanted their luggage to be as compact as possible, so the makers of cutlery developed knives, forks, and spoons that could be folded or that had interlocking handles. These fitted into small, specially designed cases of leather or metal. Here's a picture of utensils with detachable handles and leather carrying cases. France and Italy, 16th and 17th centuries, courtesy of the Cooper Hewitt Museum, so Smithsonian Institution. At first, most table forks had only two long, flat tines. But by the end of the 1600s, English and continental cutlers had started to manufacture forks with three and four tines and gave them a slight curve. The additional tines ena enabled diners to pick up meat and vegetables more easily, and the curve made a the fork a more efficient scoop. The widespread adoption of the table fork affected the design of both spoons and knives. Before the 1600s, most European spoons were of a single size. They had large fig-shaped bowls and rounded stems and were used to bring to the mouth everything from soup to stew. Now spoons began to take on the egg-shaped bowls and flat stems that we're familiar with today. The new style spoons came in two basic sizes. The larger ones were called tablespoons and the smaller ones teaspoons. Tea had arrived in Europe for the first time early in the 17th century as trade with the Far East expanded. Coffee reached Europe at about the same time, brought by Italian merchant seamen who traded with Turkey. People felt the need of a smaller spoon to stir the popular new beverages, so they invented the teaspoon. Now let's go back a minute. There's an image here of a knife and fork with matching ivory handles. German, 17th century, courtesy of the Bayerisch National Museum, Munich. I'll hold it this way, you can see better. The design of table knives changed even more noticeably. Now that people throughout Europe were eating with forks, they no longer needed knives with sharp points to spear their food. Consequently, by the end of the 17th century, most European table knives were made with rounded ends, like the one we just looked at. I hope you saw that. Here's an image of the, a royal feast at the French court in the time of Cardinal Richelieu engraving by uh, Abraham Boss, 1633, courtesy of the Prince Division, the New York Public Library. Some say that Cardinal Richelieu, the, a French religious and political leader was responsible for this change in knife design. The cardinal frequently entertained at dinner a nobleman who was in the habit of picking his teeth with the point of his knife. Disgusted with the man's behavior, the cardinal had the points of all of his table knives ground down, and others in the French court followed the cardinal's lead. Whether that story is true or not, it's known that in 1669, King Louis the 14th of France, in order to discourage violence, made it illegal for anyone to carry a pointed knife, for cutlers to make them, or for innkeepers to put them on their tables. The king further commanded that the points of all existing table knives be rounded off. Frenchmen were quick to obey, and the new style of knife design traveled rapidly to England, Holland, Belgium, and other European countries. I was distracted because I wanted to tell you about Louis, King Louis the 14th 
That was a time when I had to read Roman numerals. We talked about those earlier this year. I'm pointing to the line. Can you see those Roman numerals? King, Louis, and it says X, I, V. So it's 10 and then it's one less than five. V is five and one is, or the I is one. So it's one less than five. That's how I figured out it was King Louis the 14th. Besides influencing knife design, Louis XIV became the first host in Europe to provide his guests with a complete table setting. No longer did visitors to one of Louis's palaces have to bring their own utensils with them. Instead, when they sat down to dinner, they could use the handsome silver knives, forks, and spoons, all bearing the royal insignia that were laid at every place. Louis himself always ate with utensils made of gold. It was one of the reasons he was called the Sun King. From France, the custom of providing table utensils spread to the other royal courts of Europe and from them to the houses of the nobility. As the 17th century drew to an end, well-to-do people everywhere were buying matching sets of flatware, knives, forks, and spoons for their tables. Most of these sets were made of silver. In less than 100 years, the way people ate in Europe had changed more than it had in the previous thousand. Not only had the fork been introduced, but the shapes of knives and spoons had drastically been altered. But place has, plates had replaced trenchers, and many families now own flatware. For the first time since the days of the Roman Empire, diners in wealthy homes were given napkins as a matter of course. Here's an image of an upper-class French family at breakfast, engraving by Lepici after a painting by Francois Boucher, from 1703 to 1770, courtesy of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. To reflect all these changes, new books on table manners were needed, and they soon began to appear. In 1729, a French priest published a guide to behavior for young gentlemen. In it, he wrote, at table, you should always use a napkin, a plate, a knife, a spoon, and a fork. It is improper to use the napkin to wipe your face or rub your teeth clean, and it would be one of the grossest offenses against civility to use it to blow your nose. The only use you may make of the napkin is to wipe your mouth, lips, and fingers when they become soiled. The priest continued, it is polite always to use the fork to put meat into your mouth for propriety does not permit the touching of anything greasy with the fingers. How different from the advice Erasmus had given his young readers just 200 years earlier. Then you were expected to eat meat with your fingers. Now such behavior was thought to be offensive and uncivilized. Another Frenchman writing in 1765 summed up the changes that had occurred. If people who died in 1700 could come back to life, he wrote, they would not recognize Paris as far as its table manners were concerned. More changes were soon to come. The Industrial Revolution, which started in England in the late 1700s, would spur the growth of mass production, including the manufacture of table utensils. And the people of a new nation, the United States of America, would develop their own unique way of using those utensils. The next chapter is gonna be the rise and fall of table manners. I'm eager to read that one. That might be our last chapter after that, is it? No, a couple more. See you next time.